I have been asked to, and I'm not entirely certain what the procedure is, but to repeat the remarks made at the dedication of the National Cemetery at, at Gettysburg and, and also to give some other remarks regarding it. Is this the time for both or just the, the former? He's giving me the, the nod. <laughs> well, the, the struggles at, at Gettysburg, of course, were signal, and I don't, uh, is 20 or 30 minutes too much time? For those of you who are standing, probably yes, but uh, for, for the rest of you, uh, that would be fine. All right. Well, I, I don't want to bore you with too many military details, but I think uh, perhaps concluding with the actual remarks that I made there would be well. Um, if I gave you the dessert before the meal, you'd all leave. So, uh, but I think to understand the significance of the struggle that took place in that small Pennsylvania town, it would be well to perhaps get a little bit of uh, background on the nature of the struggle itself, the entire war. Uh, can you all hear me? All right. It's, it's, it's difficult to tell with the, the train. The, na the nature of the war itself, from the very beginning, presented an almost insoluble difficulty, which it, we feared could never um, be resolved. A civil war, by definition, requires some sort of result, unless we end up in eternal anarchy, which was a possibility. But all we had as we saw this looming upon the horizon was the examples of history. When I was a boy, the British took over the Irish, the Scots a few years later, and the Welsh, and in my lifetime, and some of yours as well, they have revolted. In 1859, before the year before I was elected, the people of India revolted, and there was civil war, if you will, at least according to the British. How did it conclude? The British war steamers went over and Her Majesty's military might was seen and that continues to this day to hold the lid on the kettle. So, with such an example before us, as we looked at the possibility of civil war, how could it conclude here? Even if we should suppress rebellion, should we maintain by sending military throughout all of the insurgent states, then what becomes of our free republic? It, it was of a nature that would destroy liberty no matter how we looked at it. And so the original plan with that in mind, and, and you realize there was no single man in the country who had ever seen a force before all of this began of as many as 16,000. Now General Grant commands well over half a million himself. So um, I had only two men who had commanded as many as 13,000 back in the Mexican War, that were General Scott and Wool when this all began. And both of them, seeing the difficulties I just alluded to, had one voice and that was called the Anaconda Plan. Now, I brought a little map here, I don't know if you can see it, but the rebellion commenced in seven of the 15 slaveholding states, and once we responded to their attack on federal properties, four more states joined them, and we ended up with 11 out of the 15 slaveholding states declaring some sort of national independence. The council was called the Anaconda Plan, and that was simply, we must surround them, but don't attack. Because once it concluded, how will we maintain the result of devastation and destruction in our own country by military force? And so the council was to go very carefully, simply cut off supplies and surround the South. Now this map shows 
those of, probably none of you can see this, but there's a dark line at the top, which was the beginning of the war. The red line was where we were when the battles at Gettysburg commenced. But the southern portion of the country was the essential hub of rebellion. Unfortunately, surrounding it was nigh unto impossible. Some of you older ones will remember, traditionally Southerners never wanted to have factories, forgeries, foundries, mills, all the sorts of things that Yankees do. My goodness. Well, now that there was a gigantic rebellion underfoot, how were they going to come about with the weapons of war? They all had to be brought in from sympathetic nations who also believed that there should be a ruling class. So they came across Mexico. Now, how are we going to surround the rebellion when they're getting their supplies from across Mexico, out of England and France? There weren't enough soldiers in all all of the world to surround the entire Western Hemisphere. And so it was never implemented. It was impossible. What's the next best plan? Do we have any former military or present military men among us? What's the next, perhaps in some cases, even the best plan for concluding a rebellion? Oh my goodness, even the child knows this. <laughs> Son, yeah. if you can't get something from your mother, where do you go? To your father. To your father. <laughs> I told you, children understand this. It's called divide and conquer. Correct? Yeah. Yes. Does it work? Yes. Yes. <laughs> so, where would be the logical place to divide the rebellion? The Mississippi River. At St. Louis. It's nearly a mile wide. Down around New Orleans, over two in places, especially when it's flooded. So it was a natural barrier, and it was from the Trans-Mississippi region in the west where they got their supplies. So that became the plan. However, one small difficulty. Out in the middle of Mississippi stands a great fortress called Vicksburg, erected on the bluffs. The great Mississippi flows before it three times. How does a river do that? It forms an S before the city. Now, if any of our military boats were disabled, which way would they flow? Girls, you look like you might go to school. Which <laughs> direction does the Mississippi flow? You're not a girl. <laughs> I'm trying to put them on the spot here, and you're not helping me. It flows into New Orleans, correct? They study geography in school, don't they? So, what would happen if our gunboats were disabled, girls? These two. Where would they go? Into the hands of the Southerners, correct? Yes. All right. I'm not going to bark up that tree anymore. <laughs> well, obviously, we couldn't do that. They, you heard of the battles between the Merrimack and the Monitor. They, they sunk one of our United States frigates, raised it up, clad it with iron plating, and turned it against us. So the plan was shelved. But we were not doing well. So, you know who finally became the salvation? The, who, who came up with a plan that brought us to a conclusive victory? I'll give you a hint. It wasn't a military gentleman. In fact, it wasn't a gentleman at all. It was a woman. A civilian. She came from... Baltimore area, lived on what they call the Eastern Shore. Her name was Anna Ellen Carroll, the daughter of a former governor of Maryland, came to my office and explained how she had traveled at her own expense all the way to St. Louis, talked to a riverboat captain, and you know what she discovered? There's a river just about 50 miles east of the Mississippi near 
its mouth about 200 miles near its headwaters. Now, you have to understand when I'm referring to the mouth of the river and the head of the river, rivers are very much like lawyers, narrow in the head, wide at the mouth. <laughs> so this river just east of the Mississippi River also flows north and south. However, the mouth of the river, the widest part, is on the north. The headwaters are down in Muscle Shoals, Alabama. Now, I don't know about geography, and apparently I'm not the only one, but uh, <laughs> somehow the Mississippi flows north to south, but the Tennessee River flows south to north, and it's only a little ways east. And she said, Mr. President, that's the natural incursion into the rebel territory. If they disable our ships on the Tennessee, they will fall back into our own arms. And so the plan was implemented none other, by none other than Ulysses S. Grant. What happened was the rebels invaded Kentucky, which they were not supposed to do. Kentucky was trying to remain neutral. And so General Grant sent his forces in to save them from the tyranny of the rebels. And he sailed up the Tennessee, which meant he went down south and took Fort Donaldson. And that was early in the war, February 62. And from there, he began to move into the backyard of Vicksburg. Once Vicksburg could be taken, that would cut off the supplies of the rebels. Now, I thought I was gonna talk about Gettysburg. <laughs> Strategically, Vicksburg was very important, divide and conquer. But Gettysburg was a ruse. I have some sources in the South, not always reliable. Some of them are, in fact, slaves. And some informers are in very high places. I cannot say who they are or where they are. And it became known to me that the command in the South was urging all military rebel forces to go to Vicksburg to defend that citadel. But one was adamantly opposed, and that was Robert E. Lee. He said, it makes more sense, since our largest army is already in the East, to divert their attention. Let's go north of the capital and draw some of them away. And then what forces we already have there will be able to use the time well and defend the city. And that's what they did. Gettysburg, you can't see this map, but you can come look later, is directly north of Washington. Now, whereas Gettysburg is not strategically important, it is symbolically vital because if they took the national capital from the back door, just as we were seeking to take Vicksburg through the back door. You can just leave that, they can't see it anyway. <laughs> All would be lost. The hesitation that the European powers had felt because of our blockade and other conditions that we had laid would all be removed if the national capital fell before insurgents. And so it suddenly, and I mean very quickly, became a vital necessity that we have victory at Gettysburg. Well, what happened was there had been some <clears throat> military difficulties just preceding this, and I had gone through several generals and just placed George Gordon Meade in command. The difficulty I had had was, was primarily military politics, Meade didn't participate in any of that, and he seemed to be a good soldier, but he was untried. The battles began surrounding the anniversary of our national existence, the first, second, and third days of July, and concluded signally, I thought, on the fourth day. What happened, of course, for us, was very difficult to determine in Washington we had constant reporting, but much of it was conflicting. Longstreet had been killed. No, no, he hadn't. He wasn't even wounded. Oh, yes, he was. He was dying. No, he wasn't. 
Sickles had been killed. No, he, he was on our side. Well, Sickles had been wounded, actually. He lost his leg. But on the 3rd of July, he came to Washington, leg in hand. And uh, he's an odd duck. And uh, <laughs> proceeded to give us a report. I, he rented a home where he was recovering, and I and my son went. He had a little aide de camp by the name of J Gus Shorman, who I had seen uh, down at Fredericksburg the previous spring, and Tad had made friends with Gus. Gus was only about 12 years old, and had come to the, stay for some months with us in the executive mansion, and right before these battles commenced, Sickles came and, and got little uh, Mr. Sherman, and off they went. So Tad was very anxious for his friend's safety. We both went and in interviewed. And as you know, we barely escaped destruction in that place, but because of the fortitude and courage and daring do and perhaps audacity of certain individuals, we were able to drive them out. Well, at that juncture, it seemed that we had a national victory in our grasp because on the third day of July, Vicksburg fell as well before General Grant. My friends, Washington was filled with celebrating. The cannonade was constant, the church bells pealed day and night, people were singing and marching in the streets. The war was over, as far as we knew. We had them in the palm of our hand, and the heavens themselves seemed to be fighting for us because as soon as the rebels began to flee, the clouds began to gather. Some of the little streams and rivulets around Gettysburg, my friends, raised up from their normal level in excess of nine feet. And that watershed all flows into the Potomac, the natural barrier between the North and the South at that place. And so Lee and his armies were backed up against the Potomac. They couldn't keep their bontoon boats in the water. We had them in our hands, in our grasp. The second, the third, the fourth, the victory, and then the wait. By the seventh, I was beginning to wonder, how long can this last? Meade was still in Gettysburg. As late as the 11th, he was still in Gettysburg. And Lee was still backed up against the Potomac, struggling, wondering, when would they come? As we were in Washington. Finally, on the 14th day, 10 days, my friends, after the battles concluded, the waters receded and they escaped. My friends, I cannot tell you, I was immeasurably distressed. I, I felt like if I could have gone up there, I could have ended this myself. <laughs> but I couldn't. And I finally did not go up until four months later. Now, when the battles were taking place, there was a play in Washington of cholera. The people in Gettysburg were very fearful that that plague would spread. My father-in-law, Mrs. Lincoln's father, died of cholera. From the first symptom to the last hang and the last breath is drawn, it can take as little as six hours by unburied bodies. So the people in Gettysburg were very frightened of what should take place, as well as the people in Washington because of the cholera. When the battles were finally over and the four months had passed, we had another plague in Washington, this time smallpox. Washington is a very unhealthy place. <laughs> Mrs. Lincoln was distraught. We had lost a son a little over a year to fevers and things from unhealthy conditions. And now people all over the city were dying of smallpox. And Tad had fallen very ill and was already somewhat weakened as it was from the years prior. So she begged that I would not go. But my friends, you cannot imagine the enormity of the national mourning that was encapsulated in this one small village. When General Grant finally got a headquarters established after the battles at Fort Donaldson at a place called Corinth, Mississippi. There had been fighting. Nearly 16,000 casualties took place at that juncture. 
Now, that's more than all of the casualties of the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, and the Mexican War. At Corinth, that Pittsburgh Landing, Gettysburg surpassed 16,000. It surpassed 50,000. And many of the people who had lost loved ones were from all over the environs of this country. Unfortunately, It's a Democrat train. <laughs> Unfortunately, when those many thousands of casualties took place and people began to go to find their husbands, their sons, their brothers, the people at Gettysburg were so frightened of the cholera that they went into the fields and, and invited people from all of the participating states to come and help bury the dead and care for the wounded. And many hundreds of thousands did. But the relatives came into the same fields and uncovered those same newly made graves looking for their dear ones. And we had to post military guards all about the battlefield to keep these poor folks out because of very real fears. And they were told not until the winter cold comes. And so the ceremony was to take place in November. And after that, the people would be released into the fields. The morning that I was there, there were still soldiers that had been unattended to for four months who were very seriously deteriorated by now, still laying where they fell or where they had crawled to and died. So, the, the amount of mourning is indescribable and I felt I had to go. Two days before the ceremony took place, I decided to go. John Garrett, of, the director of the Baltimore and Ohio, loaned me his personal car, which was well appointed, and we traveled the day before. There were countless thousands on their way, mostly on foot, many riding, some driving, ordinary people like you and I, knowing that once this dedication took place, they could find the ones for whom their hearts grieved. Well, many of the, them were on trains, hundreds literally, were put on spurs and sidings and told the president's train is about to arrive. Well, we were delayed in Baltimore, but we finally did get there that evening and when I disembarked on the platform, I saw dozens of coffins newly built. And I was appalled. As we went through the city, Mr. Wills had let me stay in his own private chambers. Um, there were thousands of people all about us. Our carriage and places could barely get through because these myriads couldn't, could find no place to lay their head. I found out later that Dr. Everett, who was the main speaker, and myself alone had the only beds in the whole county that were only going to be occupied by one person. Oh my goodness. Everyone else slept three, four, and five in a bed if they had a bed. If you had a cheer, you counted yourself most fortunate, and the vast majority had to stand. They could not even risk being seated on a humble door stoop to catch a few weeks of slumber lest they awaken in the midst of or shortly after a robbery because the nefarious elements had nearly outnumbered them in many places. So all through the city there were people milling about, singing, giving speeches, talking, joking until late in the night just to stay awake. It was about 2 a.m. when I finally closed my eyes after hearing that Mrs. Lincoln and Tad were both feeling better. The following morning, Mr. Seward and I concluded to hire one of the uh, draymen to take us out into the battlefield to see what had in fact taken place. And we saw soldiers that were still lying where they fell four months earlier. It was indescribable, my friends. 
About 10 o'clock, we met in the city, what they called the Diamond, and we all proceeded in, in a formal uh, procession to the platform, which is about 20 feet by 10, where we, we alone were seated. The, the thousands who had come, most of which, there were, there were probably nearly 100 are, most of which could not hear anything that was said. But when the ceremonies began with Mr. Lehman reading the apologies for the many governors that could not attend, there was a young man standing before me who I believe from his response had partaken in the battles. Dr. Everett concluded his wonderful remarks that had covered the struggles for liberty over many years by describing the battles themselves, and this soldier seemed to recognize everything that he referred to. When it was finally my turn to make my few brief remarks, this is what I said. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now, we are engaged in a great civil war testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We're met on a great battlefield of that war. We've come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place. For those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. Then I went on to say, providing no trains come, <laughs> that it was altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note or long remember what we say here. But it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Well, that was the conclusion of my few brief remarks. I, I felt honored that Dr. Everett chose to, con to include my remarks with the Gettysburg Address, which he delivered and was published in many lovely volumes with maps and military descriptions, but I was, I think, particularly pleased that he wrote me a little letter afterwards saying that he thought I got nearer the point in two minutes than he did in two hours. <laughs> but I wasn't feeling particularly well by that point anyway, and was glad that they had only asked me to say a little. Uh, they had some food prepared for us I did not wish to eat, and I fell quite ill on my return and had to take to my bed. Mr. Johnson, who had come with me from Washington and in fact from Illinois, he was my footman, a dear colored friend, also was not feeling well and, and perished from the smallpox. I did not get it so bad um, and had to conduct business from my bed, but I finally recovered. I, I thought it was interesting after all of this time, having hundreds of people wanting appointments and offices and positions which I could not give 
And I, I felt like the old sow had too many pigs and not enough tits to go around. <laughs> now I finally had something I could give to everybody and nobody wanted it. <laughs> but General Grant, of course, became a national hero at that time because of Vicksburg. General Meade, not so much because of Gettysburg. But um, Grant was then put into position in eastern Tennessee in a place that was vital for us to do what we had already done, to divide and conquer once more. It took nearly a year, but once Grant secured Chattanooga and they began to move down towards Atlanta, we saw that one more division might turn the tide, and in fact it did. In the fall of 64, right before the election, he took Atlanta, which is a major railroad juncture in the south, allowing supplies to now be cut off from Richmond. And the following Christmas, when he presented the city of Savannah on the coast to us as a nation, as a Christmas present, almost all knew that the end was indeed in sight. So, divide and conquer. <laughs> a good strategy. Now, I don't know if any of you have any questions. You've been very patient and kind, and I do appreciate that. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may wish to take. Other than that, thank you very kindly. I'll be available if you wish to come up privately and ask something that you didn't want to ask in front of the ladies. <laughs> Thank you.